In the previous videos, we have talked about transactions. We have looked at how they are constructed, what payment or unlocking conditions they can contain, and how they are used in the context of the Bitcoin network. But one thing we haven't looked into so far is how they end up in the blockchain, how they are actually confirmed. And it turns out that is through the use of blocks, that is collections of transactions. Now, starting from this video, we will look into these blocks, how they are assembled, how we can establish a chain structure and how we eventually reach a consensus. All right, so let's start with the consensus. Uh, so with the question on how when, when you have these different uh, databases that are stored with each of these nodes, how they can reach a common state, how they can reach a common understanding of what is the current state of the database of the blockchain. Now, we have to start with our network once again. Um, remember, uh, these are all of the full nodes. We had some um, dependent nodes right here that have been explained in the extended Bitcoin network also right here. But right now we're really talking about the core Bitcoin network, so about the full nodes and how transactions are propagated. And at this point, what's really important to understand, we have a newly issued transaction uh, right here with TRX, that's our transaction. And it has been uh, relayed, has been communicated with this node right here. So this guy already has the information. Now what's important to understand at this point, the transaction is not part of the blockchain. What we're looking at right now is how it is propagated from node to node. But this really is uh, something you could refer to as a transaction queue. So whenever somebody receives this transaction, what they are doing is they are putting it into the transaction queue or mempool, but at this point it is not confirmed, it is not part of the blockchain. So let's assume this person right here has a transaction, uh, has it verified, and then uh, its peers are requesting the transaction so it gets transferred, that they also have a copy of it. Then again, their peers are also requesting the transaction as we have seen in the previous lectures, and then they also know about it until the entire network knows about this transaction. But once again, and I cannot stress that enough, this transaction, although at this point, almost everyone knows about it, or in this simple case, in this simple example, in our simple model, everyone knows about it, it still is not part of the blockchain. It's just in these local transaction queues or mempools awaiting the confirmation, awaiting to be included in the blockchain. So how does it work? Once again, um, the nodes send the transaction to their peers. Uh, recall that um, this is a, a pull process. So they are uh, actively asking for these transactions, the ones who, uh, the, the peers who receive it. Uh, each node verifies the received transaction. They verify the inputs, the outputs. They make sure uh, that the amounts are in compliance with the rules so that no one actually has created a transaction that spends more than is, that in, than is put in there in terms of inputs. They also verify the script SICK if it, it does indeed provide the solution to the script POP key. And if everything is okay, if everything matches out, they put it into their mempool, into their transaction queue, and it can be requested by other peers, so it can be forwarded to other peers. Uh, and again, it's stored in their local mempool. So at this point, we really have this we have a situation where all of these full nodes, they have their personal transaction queues, they have their personal backlog of transactions that are waiting for inclusion into the blockchain. And the question now really is, how do we confirm these transactions? So, uh, I mean, we get it now, uh, there is this peer-to-peer -peer network, we, we know how to assemble these transactions. We know that these transactions are sent across the network but what we don't understand yet, what we haven't tackled yet, is how these transactions actually end up in the blockchain and are confirmed. And the way this works is um, by uh, special nodes, not special in the sense that they have any special privileges, but special in the, in the sense that they are uh, choosing uh, to engage in this activity, and these nodes are uh, called minus. Uh, what they are doing essentially is they are assembling so-called blocks, a block being a collection of transactions, uh, and they are trying um, to come up with a solution, and you will see later on how this works, that allows their block to be included in the blockchain. But right now, let's look at the block assembly. So let's look what exactly they are doing. Um, essentially, they are choosing a subset of transactions in their in their transaction queue in the mempool and they're adding them to this this block they're adding it to this this 
block a candidate block to this collection, uh, basically to their proposal that may be added to the blockchain later on. How does it work? How do we assemble these candidate blocks? Now, there are, of course, different components. So the first thing, uh, let's focus on the uh, right side right here. Um, that's basically the, the structure of your block. And uh, we will look into the components one by one. So of course, there will be in this empty space, there will be more components showing up. But the first thing you have to be aware of is that obviously when we talk about blocks, an important role, uh, an important component of this block are transactions. Now, we will talk about the block header. That's basically the most important part of the block. Uh, that's the one that is also, uh, that's the part that is also used in the consensus protocol later on. So it's just the essential ingredients basically. And you might be wondering, okay, when I look at this graph right here, this simplification, why are the transactions not part of this block header? Um, there is only something called the Merkle root, but not the transactions themselves. And it is indeed, uh, uh, true that the transactions, they are somewhat separate. They're not part of this block header, um, but there is a representation of all of the transactions that are part of the block in the block header, and that is exactly this Merkle root. And before we look into the detail of this Merkle tree structure that uh, results in the Merkle root, you have to understand that essentially it's just uh, hash functions again. So something you have already learned about earlier, uh, these hash functions, they are employed to create uh, this Merkle tree structure, this Merkle root that essentially secures all of the transactions and uh, makes a, a secure reference in the block header. So the way it works is uh, assume you have various transactions. So for example, transaction A, transaction B, transaction C, and so on. Uh, what you're doing then is you're hashing these transactions pairwise. So for example, here at this uh, node right here, you'd have H of A, B, so transaction A and B, which is just the SHA, the double SHA-256, uh, so the, the SHA-256 hash function applied twice of A and B, okay? You put that in there. And then you end up with some hash value right here, and you do the same thing for this side right here, where you have transaction C, uh, potentially transaction D, and so on. Now, in, in there, whenever there is an uneven uh, number, of, uh, of, of transactions so that, that you cannot hash it in that way, you're just gonna repeat the last element. So the, the missing element to make sure that it actually can be hashed. Okay, so in this case, when there are only three transactions, uh, you would just uh, use C, so this transaction right here, twice. Uh, again, what you're doing is you're just taking two transactions and you're hashing them pairwise. And then you end up in this case with H of AB, in this case with H of CC, uh, and what you're doing is, once again, you're hashing these two uh, values right here. Um, and then you receive a, a new hash value. So in this case, it would be the SHA-256, the double SHA-256 of HAB and HCC. So it would be the hash value of two hash values. And you do that pairwise, you, you really construct this tree structure until the only thing you're left with is one hash value. And that is your Merkle root. So the entire thing the, if we, we see here is called a Merkle tree. It can be much larger than what you're seeing right here. In this Merkle tree, you're hashing the transactions pairwise. You're taking the resulting hash values and again hashing them pairwise until you end up with just one hash value. And this is your Merkle root. And this is essentially uh, what represents all of the transactions. So. The reason why you're doing that is when you're adding this Merkle root to the block header, uh, then no one later on can change a transaction without you noticing. Uh, whenever there's the slightest change to one of these transactions, then of course you would end up with a completely different Merkle root. Uh, this would have the avalanche effect once again, and then it would immediately be apparent. And also, as you will see later on, this would affect the entire block. So essentially with this Merkle root, all of the transactions, although they are separate of the block header, are secured in the block header, and that is really important. It's really a compact 256 bit entry that secures all of these transactions. And the reason why it is done in a Merkle tree structure is because it's just much more efficient when you wanna verify uh, whether it's a single transaction, for example, uh, is part of this structure uh, in contrast to other uh, hash algorithms that wouldn't employ this Merkle tree structure. So it's just for efficiency reasons, but essentially you can think of it as a, as a regular uh, hash algorithm as, a, as a, the employment of a regular hash function to secure that these transactions are part of the block header. But that's component one. And you can see that's right, right 
here, the Merkle root that represents all of these transactions. Now, what else is part of the block header? You have a, a version number, and the version number essentially is just a rule set by which blocks are assembled, by which these blocks are created. Um, this is really important when you, and we will talk about that in the context of forks, uh, when you want to change the rule set. So when there is an update, an upgrade to the network where the rule set is slightly changed and you need a new version number to make sure that you know in accordance with which rules uh, this block has been created. Then we have the, the reference. This will be really important later on. The reference essentially is just the hash value of the predecessor block. So whenever you create a block, you're picking a status quo. Uh, that's essentially just the last valid block of this chain structure that you will see later on. And what you're doing is you're taking the hash value of the block header of the previous block and put it in here uh, as an input. So, so as the, as the uh, reference right here. And then you also have the timestamp that just gives you some rough indication uh, when this block has been created, when this block has been assembled. Uh, there is no exact time. Uh, it wouldn't make any sense in this decentralized network because people might have a different understanding of time. Um, there isn't, it isn't in, in completely synchronous. It might, be, it might have some deviations. Uh, but the rule is that this timestamp must at least be the median timestamp of the previous 11 blocks. Uh, so that's the minimum, and it cannot be any larger than two hours in the future at the time of confirmation. So that's really the range you can be in uh, for it to be valid. And again, that, that allows you to um, later on look at approximately when this block has been created. What else? We also have the threshold value. Um, this is hard to understand right now since we haven't looked into proof of work yet, but the threshold value um, is really specifies the maximum hash value of a block header that may uh, you may come up with uh, in order for it to be to be valid. So you will see later on, I have to give you a quick teaser right now. I don't want to go into too much specifics because we have an entire slide deck just in proof of work. But the idea is that a block only will be valid uh, when it has a uh, hash value, when its block header has a hash value that lies be uh, below a certain threshold. And this threshold value uh, is also uh, added to the block header. Uh, so it is part of the block header. And then you have the nonce and the nonce will be the primary source of variation. Again, that's something uh, we need for proof of work. We need for the consensus algorithm. Algorithm. You will see that later on why exactly this is used. But for now, all you need to know is that nonce in this case stands for number only used once and that you can uh, uh, pick an arbitrary number and change this, not this number. And it gives you a source of variation uh, without having to change the other contents of the block. So that's, that's basically the idea. Good. So that was the uh, uh, block creation. So assembling a block with its with its main contents right here um, should give you a good understanding of how what a block block looks like and uh, how how it can be assembled. And again, that's essentially what all uh, nodes can do. It's it's actually quite straightforward to do so, and it is part of the standard distribution, software distribution. So it's it's not really a big deal or anything that's computationally intensive. Um, you can just do that with your, your client software and do it really, really fast. Now, what you also have to understand, we talk about the blockchain essentially. So we talk about the uh, chain structure, a sequence of blocks and not about individual blocks. So of course there must be some additional elements and uh, you can see that right here. Uh, we will actually look into that in greater detail later on. But the way this chain structure is created is you have a block right here, block zero with all of its contents. Block zero has a hash value. And then uh, assuming this is a status quo, this is the uh, latest valid block, then uh, everyone else would be trying to create a new block on top of it. And on top of it essentially means that they are taking the hash value uh, of the block header of block zero and adding it as an input here in block one, so in the, in the uh, uh, successor. Um, again, then you have all these contents. Uh, once while a block is found, block one has a hash value, and this hash value is then put into the next successor, so in block two and so on. Now, when you're referring to a specific block, there are really different ways to do so. Uh, number one, you could talk about the block height. Excuse me, block height right here. And that's, that's really a static number. Um, so it would, you would start with block zero right here. So this one would have height zero. This one would have height one, 
hide Q. Um, uh, why, why I'm saying static? Quite easily because uh, when there are additional blocks added, this number for a specific block doesn't change. So um, when you're referring to block three, it doesn't matter how many other blocks are added to the blockchain later on, uh, block three will always be uh, the same one. So uh, for example, a uh, block with, with height three, ex excuse me, would be this one, even if you're adding additional ones. Uh, what's important is well, we will be talking about forks. So where there are disagreements uh, about the current state of the blockchain. And in case of a fork, as you will see later on, the block height uh, may not be unique. It may not be clearly defined. There may be conflicting uh, blocks, competing blocks at the same height. The block depth basically is the uh, opposite direction uh, you can look at. So you're saying, okay, how deep into the blockchain is a certain block? The latest block, so the most recent one, has a block depth of zero. And this one right here has one conf uh, has, has uh, two confirmations. So uh, itself right here has been confirmed once and then an additional block on top of it, and this would give it a block depth of one, okay? So when you have one successor, then you have a block depth of one. When you have two successors, then you have a block depth of two, and so on for a specific block. And obviously that's not static, that's dynamic. Whenever a new block is, uh, is added to the blockchain, to the sequence, then all of the previous ones, the, the block depth of all of the previous blocks will be increased by one. Uh, it's quite straightforward. And also, uh, once again, in case of a fork, uh, there may be competing blocks uh, with the with the same block depth. Uh, it is unique within one given version of the blockchain, obviously, but when there are competing versions of a blockchain, uh, again, a so-called fork, then this may not be unique. And the last one, it's actually the uh, one we have talked about uh, previously. It's the block header hash value. Uh, so when you're, when you're assembling this block header with all of its contents, then you have a resulting hash value. And uh, that's essentially just a block ID. It's static, so it doesn't change uh, because it's given by its contents. And also, even though in theory there are uh, maybe collisions in practice uh, due to the cryptography involved, due to the characteristics of these hash functions, um, collisions can be ruled out, so they are not relevant in practice. So it is a static and unique ID essentially that allows you to refer to a specific block. So let's talk about the domino effect, and that's really important. Uh, once again, when you're looking at this chain structure, then on the on the here we go. On the left, you have this one block right here. Uh, again, you have its contents. So you have the transactions that result in the Merkle root, nonce, threshold value, timestamp, reference, and diversion. And hashing this block header, uh, you get uh, a certain uh, a certain hash value here, represented on the top. So the, the double SHA-256 would result of, of these contents will result in this hash value you're seeing right here. And then when you create a new one, as I've explained, a new block, well, what you're doing is you're referencing this hash value here, the one on top, right here. You're referencing that as a content in your new block right here, and it becomes an input, okay? And then it's, it's one of the inputs in the new block. Uh, and of course, since it is one of the inputs of the block header, um, it also affects the hash value of the second block. So on the basis of all the contents, including transactions, including the hash value of the uh, predecessor, uh, you essentially end up with this new hash value of this second block right here, and so on. So essentially, once you have done this, uh, you're using this hash value uh, as the status quo and reference it in the next candidate block, so right here. Okay, this this really creates this, this, trans this, this block sequence. This really creates this block chain. That's why it is called blockchain. It is a chain of blocks, hence blockchain. Now, it becomes really interesting once you change something, once you try to attack a block. Let's say uh, you have the great idea and you're saying, okay, uh, actually I want to remove one of the transactions in the first block. Uh, um, obviously you cannot just arbitrarily add new ones uh, because uh, I, I cannot just, um, let's say, uh, steal Bitcoin from someone else because it's still protected by the uh, uh, cryptography. I'd still have to uh, deliver uh, a valid script six, so that is ruled out. But one thing I could potentially do uh, is just removing one of the transactions from the block. So say, saying uh, this never happened, essentially, pretending that this never happened and removing one of the uh, previously confirmed transactions from one of these blocks. Uh, 
So let us assume that's an attack I want to conduct. Okay, let us assume that's what I'm trying to do. Then I would change the transactions here. I would remove one, one of the transactions uh, from this block. Obviously, this would result in a different Merkle root when you're hashing all of the transactions and I have just removed the transaction. It's not part of the block anymore. Then I would end up with a different Merkle root. And since the Merkle root is part of the block header, uh, obviously when I'm hashing all of these contents right here, I would, up, I would end up with a different hash value for the block header. Now the reason why this is important is um, twofold actually. One has to do with the proof of work consensus algorithm that you will see later on. But uh, for today, for this video, what is important is that you're breaking the reference. Okay, so you would have an invalid reference right here. Why? Because recall that we have referenced the old hash value um, with, with the original contents, with the original transactions, and once we change these contents in our first block right here and end up with a different hash value, this reference will be broken. So what we would have to do to fix that is change the reference in our second block. But then, of course, this would affect the hash value up here. So we would end up with a completely new hash value for our second, excuse me, for our second block. Okay, so this reference to block three would be broken because as you can see right here, block three still references the old hash value of block two. And this really is a domino effect. This really creates this domino effect whenever you change something in a block. This block and all of the successors uh, have to be changed as well. Uh, really because of this reference, really because of this hash value secured chain structure. And that will be a really important factor in the security concept and the security architecture of the blockchain. That is the way essentially you, you secure the structure, you secure individual transactions, you secure the status quo. Uh, that is the basic idea behind it. That whenever the slightest change can be easily identified and whenever something is changed, you have to recreate everything um, starting from this block and everything behind it, everything behind it in this sequence. Okay, now, so far that, that's great and that gives you some intuition uh, potentially, but um, I mean, I, I, I told you earlier that anyone can just create these candidate blocks and it's actually quite straightforward. It's not computationally intensive. You don't need a lot of computational resources to do that uh, if we don't add any further restrictions. Just assembling these blocks and coming up with some hash value uh, doesn't really put any limitations in there. And the problem, and that will actually be the question and the starting point for the lectures that are to come, the problem we are facing right now is when we are not adding any further limitations, then anyone that is part of the network, so be it Tony, Michelle, Tamara, Marsha, Brian, Jake, Claudia, you name it, anyone that is part of this network, anyone running a full node could essentially just create their own blocks, assemble their own blocks in fractions of seconds. They are way too fast in doing so. So they're just taking a subset of the transaction queue, throwing this subset of transactions into their candidate block, and they're done, okay? That would be really bad for one reason. Uh, all of these people, all of these full nodes, they could assemble these uh, candidate blocks faster than they could ex exchange it. So essentially they would all be working on their own personal version of the blockchain and uh, they couldn't really exchange it. They couldn't really reach a consensus. They couldn't really reach a common understanding. So you would have the blockchain, uh, so block one, block two, block three, and then essentially would split because each and every one, all of these individuals would be working on their own blockchain really, really fast. So what we need now really is a consensus algorithm, a consensus mechanism that allows these people, these full nodes to reach a consensus, to reach a common understanding of what is the current status quo and to avoid situations where everyone is just working on their own version. And that is what we will look at next time. So stay curious. See you soon.